Greetings. My name is Dr. David Smith, and I'm presenting the implementation plan for the house call services company Teladoc at Home, or as I call it, TAH. Teladoc at Home is proposed as a business subunit of the telemedicine company Teladoc Health, and its aim is to provide service into the gap where patients who have care needs that exceed those of telehealth but really don't need to go to a hospital or urgent care or emergency department for their care. And right now, those patients are not being served, except in very limited amounts in very localized areas. So this is an exciting opportunity for Teladoc Health to expand its perspectives and its horizons into this gap in care that's currently largely being unserved. And for those of us at Teladoc at home, it's an exciting time to kind of bring back an era in medicine that has been long ignored, but is part of the fabric and traditions of the profession. Talking about house calls evokes the images of the old country doctor going from house to house with his black bag, stethoscope around his neck, comforting families, listening to patients' hearts and lungs, and basically being a member of the community, a neighbor and a friend. We've lost touch with that, and it's time to bring it back. In the old days, physicians lost touch with this type of practice because it became difficult to get two patients. Suburbs, urban areas, even the rural areas became too far flung. There were too many patients to see. And as mobility and automobiles became more common among patients, it was simply easier to bring the patient to the physician. But that's changed now. Modern technology with cell services, fast computers, fast cell phones, the ability to interact with software that can move resources around. We've seen this occur with the gig economies, with Uber matching drivers with people who need rides. We've seen it with the food delivery companies. And now the same model can drive physician and healthcare resources to the patient and bring back this era of house call services. But why would a virtual health company like Teladoc want to get back into the business of seeing patients in person? There are many reasons for this. First of all, they can expand the vision from just virtual health to any type of health care that can be delivered in the comfort of a patient's home. Second, there's a serious gap between those patients whose needs can be met by a virtual health visit and those who actually need to be seen in a clinic, an office, or an urgent care, or emergency department. And right now, that gap is not being served in an efficient manner across the nation. Teladoc Health has the resources and the reach to make that happen. According to a 2020 report by Grandview Research, the size of this gap represents a market that has a value of $457 million dollars and through 2027 is supposed to have a combined annual growth rate of 5.5%. So this gap in care not only represents something that Teladoc Health through Teladoc at Home can address in a way that will improve health and wellness in communities across America, but it also represents real dollars in revenue that it's currently not tapping into. Additionally, when you look at it from what it saves patients and the resources it saves the healthcare industry as a whole, you realize that there is a number of patients who really can't afford to be going to an emergency department or an urgent care and exposing themselves to other diseases and other illnesses that are there when other patients are arriving to get care for their problems and their illnesses. This is especially acute in the course of a pandemic. When you add to this human cost, the real monetary cost that occurs when individuals get care in emergency departments and urgent cares, the facility fees that these institutions charge and add on to the total bill creates millions of dollars of additional cost to individuals, to third-party payers, to employment benefit plans. So you can see that a house call services system like Teladoc at Home would have tremendous cost and resource savings for individuals, institutions alike, and would provide real human benefits in improved care 
and reduced exposure to complicating illnesses. And it's interesting to note that one survey by the company American Well found that roughly 15 to 16 percent of virtual visits have to be elevated beyond the virtual care system. And when you translate that to the number of visits that could come just from the telehealth side of Teladoc, that would translate to roughly one to one and a half million when you base it on an estimated weighted moving average for 2021 visits of 8.6 million. Interestingly also, Teladoc's first quarter numbers would suggest that they will exceed 8.5 million visits this year. Given that, 15% of that number could be a substantial number of visits. And with a large national company like Teladoc stimulating the market and helping it grow, it is very conceivable that $457 million market value with a growth rate of 5.5% are both highly underestimated. It's important to note that these estimated visit numbers only look at the numbers for those patients who are elevated from Teladoc's virtual health system into the at-home care for Teladoc at home. They don't really adequately reflect the number of visits one might get from individuals who just come from the outside of the Teladoc system, those who become aware of Teladoc at home through good sales and marketing. They also don't reflect those who may simply prefer at-home visits. Uh, they're either more comfortable with a face-to-face -face visit at home, or they may lack internet access due to low socioeconomic status or rural location. And these individuals would potentially elevate the number of visits that Teladoc at home would see in its first years of operation. It's also important to note that the competitive landscape for Teladoc at home is very favorable. There are very few players in the market. The ones that do exist are very regional, very local. Ready only exists in a few cities. Heal is only in 10 states and only a handful of cities total. Some of these systems also send techs or medics as opposed to physicians, nurse practitioners, or PAs. Teladoc at home would be able to draw on the provider resources of Teladoc, would also have the backing of its finances and its national reach. And Teladoc also has a lot of experience with acquisitions and be, would be able to acquire one of these regional players, if not more. This would both neutralize the competition and give Teladoc at home a knowledge base in the market that it wouldn't have otherwise. All of these factors would put Teladoc at home in excellent position to launch and succeed quickly. Turning now to the resource needs and timeline of the project, Teladoc at home should be able to launch with a reasonably low capital intensity. Independent contractors will be used for medical providers, which means they will bring their own cars, transportation, basic exam equipment, uh, things like stethoscope, for instance. Also, they'll have their own cell phones, computers and such to interact with the provider portal. Teladoc's existing IT infrastructure and support staff should be sufficient to build out most of the new workflow and support the new operational procedures as they launch with Teladoc at home. Many of the, the supplies that providers would have to receive from Teladoc at home are durable, things like blood pressure machines, AccuChecks to check blood sugar, uh, pulse oximetry, those are, would last for long periods of time. They're not expensive and would not have to be resupplied frequently. Of course, physicians will have to have consumable supplies, things like medications, albuterol for nebulizer treatments, Tylenol, Motrin, uh, perhaps some basic antibiotics, although we'll have to see what types of visits become more common. Currently, the initial supply list for most providers would be based on acute care or sick visits, as well as a predicted top five visit types based on the disciplines that the different providers are trained in. And also each provider will be given a budget from which they can choose some of their own supplies based on their practice patterns. Overall though, the total supply list for the average provider is estimated to only require approximately $1,400 for initial inventory. Again, it's a very low capital intensity project. 
the cost should be very easily controlled at least initially and we expect this to not be a significant barrier to the ultimate launch and timeline of the project. It's also important to note that Teladoc has a very robust IT system. It already uses a blockchain-based cloud computing system. This will serve as the core enterprise resource module for Teladoc at Home's function. Teladoc also has a very good experience with driving resources to demand, and Teladoc at Home should be able to draw on this experience and this logistical competence in order to efficiently address its initial demands and address the growth that's expected once the system launches. Because of all the resources that Teladoc at Home can draw from and the existing infrastructure that Teladoc has, it's felt that the initial timelines for ramp up to test market from test market to launch should be fairly quick. The ramp up to test market is estimated to take roughly four three month periods or four quarters, roughly one year. In this time frame will be the hiring and onboarding of new staff. Hopefully most staff can come from existing Teladoc providers who are just willing to work with the new system. There will also have to be time to build out the new workflow, the new functions in the provider app for Teladoc at home, the portal for patient interfaces so that they can see and understand that Teladoc at home exists and when they choose to have their care done through that, that they know how to get through that port part of the portal and that interface. And of course, new routines will have to be built into Teladoc's core system to resupply providers, to do logistics and operations, to see if staffing and demand are meeting each other, and if physicians and uh, medical providers are being adequately driven to the needs that exist in their areas. All of these preparations are thought, again, to only take approximately a year due to a lot of the already existing resources that Teladoc at Home can draw from. Also, because there's a proposed test market phase before national rollout, this should limit the amount of preparation and beta testing that needs to be done prior to operationalization of the system. The test market phase itself is proposed to occur in three large cities, Philadelphia, New Orleans, and Los Angeles. These are proposed because they are large cities. They should pose a decent challenge to the new system, give an adequate stress test to detect weaknesses and problems in efficiency and also cost. Also, the geography, different regions of the country, different areas that have different terrain to some degree, and also very different people. All of these things should give a good early indication if planning pre-launch was adequate and if assumptions were correct. Also, this should give ample time for contingency planning to be done to correct any problems that should occur and make the national rollout as seamless as possible. The estimated demand in this test market phase is calculated through looking at the percentage of the population that these three test market cities represent and taking that fraction against the predicted national demand of 1.25 million visits. The monthly demand then is expected to be roughly 2,000 visits per month and this translates to approximately 30 to 35 new staff if the staff seeing patients can see as many as 15 patients per week. The 15 patients per week average is reflective of the fact that most of these physicians will probably not be using Teladoc at home as their full-time employment. And as such, they probably will not see a large number of patients on the order of 40 or 50 per week. Thus, the lower average is being used. Ultimately though, the goal of the test market phase is simply to give enough of a breadth of experience for the new system to see if the basic operational assumptions and cost estimates are accurate. The goal is to keep demand 
high enough to give that accurate assessment, but also not so high as to increase costs while the system is being fine-tuned and worked through. Also, this phase of the development will allow for the establishment of new performance improvement routines, clinical outcome measurements, and other things that will be used when the system goes national to allow for rapid improvement and targeting of good clinical outcomes and patient health initiatives. Overseeing all of this will be an implementation team that will consist of the chief medical officer, also a number of people from operations, uh, which would include data analytics, supply chain managers, uh, pharmacy and nursing, which will provide significant amount of support to medical providers in the field, HR specialists, especially those experienced in both credentialing and recruiting. And these are very different functions, especially for a medical professional service. Uh, credentialing is really about making sure that providers have all of the required training and experience and uh, job history that they say they do, also that they're compliant with state and federal regulations. And then of course, recruiting is just simply finding the best talent. Also, there would have to be software specialists uh, familiar with Teladoc's core systems and those who are now working with medical and nursing and supply chain to build out the new work routines in the Teladoc at home programming and software interfaces. Of course, executive management will be represented on the implementation team in the form of the president of Teladoc at Home, as well as finance and legal and uh, marketing. The most important members will be those core operational individuals from IT, from logistics, and from medical. One of the most important implementation team functions, however, will be the subcommittee, the Rapid Action Committee. And this group will be responsible for monitoring, identifying, and mitigating problems that arise both from errors in estimates as well as for when things perhaps go too well and also cause breakage. The core in this group will have some overlap with the implementation team. You'll still have representatives from medical as well as some executive level members. However, for the most part, this team will be mostly ad hoc uh, with individuals rotating in and out depending on which areas are being addressed and what types of mitigation strategies are being used. Ultimately, though, this group will have a tremendously important function in making sure that the system is refined, that performance improvement systems are in place, and that initial operating benchmarks and cost controls are being put in place so that when Teladoc at Home does roll out on a national level, it is ready to go and well-tuned and operating on all cylinders. Turning to the financial projections for Teladoc at Home, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the projections themselves. They're on the spreadsheets. Everybody here that is listening to this pitch can see this, what is on the spreadsheets. And the bottom line is that I wouldn't be pitching this idea if I didn't project that it was going to make money and be very successful. It's most important to understand the basic revenue model of Teladoc at Home so that you can understand why it's going to be successful. We know that Teladoc Health has been wildly successful over the last several years. Revenue has grown substantially. And it is believed that Teladoc at Home will be able to continue to use this basic revenue model to sustain its own growth. The primary revenue driver comes from giving subscriptions to third-party payers and employment benefit plans. These are charged an add-on fee, and in exchange, their members get access to Teladoc services. This would carry over to Teladoc at home. There would also be a per-visit fee for those who are not represented by a participating plan, for those who just simply want a visit from a Teladoc provider, Teladoc at home provider. 
this will also drive a substantial amount of revenue. It is believed that over time, this is actually going to represent the greatest year-on-year -year growth in the first several years of operations for Teladoc at home. And while the initial estimate is that revenue from paid subscriptions, the third-party payers and employment benefit plans will be roughly 80% of Teladoc at home revenue, the per-visit subscribers will ramp up over time and represent closer to 35, perhaps even 40, but probably 30 to 35 percent of Teladoc at home revenue. Additional consideration will be given to those who are not participating in a third-party payer plan for them to have some type of membership fee where they're given a certain number of visits per year for a flat fee. That will have to be addressed as Teladoc at Home launches and revenue streams are further assessed and determined whether or not that would be a viable or helpful model to drive further revenue capture. During the test market phase, however, Teladoc at Home does not intend to collect any uh, membership fees from third party payers and benefit plans. This is in an effort to attract more business. We simply want the employers and the benefit plans to make their members aware of Teladoc at Home's services, give them an incentive to try out the service, and give the payment plans, the third-party payers, the opportunity to see how much money they can be saved if these individuals do not go to a hospital or urgent care for additional visits or care. It's felt that it will be very easy to beat the cost of an average emergency or urgent care visit, which can be upwards of $500 or so for an urgent care visit, well over $1,500 to $2,000, if not more, for an emergency department visit. The cost savings should become very evident to these clients and more than justify the additional add-on fees that are charged later. Also through the initial phases of Teladoc at Home's launch, the per visit fees will be discounted as much as 35, even 40 percent. Again, in an effort to do promotional pricing to get more interest in having individuals who aren't in one of these participating plans uh, try the service, see if they like it, see how much they can save in terms of their out of pocket costs from deductibles and uh, co pays, and hopefully get them engaged in using the service and wanting to use it again. Also in the projections are allowances for support staff and administrative and marketing costs, as well as technology. Again, for the reasons previously mentioned, it's felt that these can be kept fairly low by using existing staff and infrastructure. As such, in the projections, those numbers were estimated to be roughly 5 to 10%, depending on the category of Teladoc's expenses in those categories in the year 2020. Ultimately, the profitability is the most important part of the projections, and in this case, the gross margin is expected to turn positive in year five after national launch and even more positive in year six. Cash flow projections also become positive in these years independently of investment from the parent company. These investments are projected to be roughly $605 million over the course of four years spread relatively evenly between cash, cash equivalents coming from Teladoc's uh, reserves and senior convertible notes that Teladoc has used in the past to finance other activities. These have been obtained at a rate of 1.25% along with the uh, con possible conversion to Teladoc stock. That has kept the average weighted cost of capital for Teladoc very low. In the last year, it's been under 3%. And it's felt that this will be able to continue as Teladoc makes investments into Teladoc at Home's launch. And if it does not wish to use any of its cash or cash equivalents, financing the additional amounts up to that $605 million still should be relatively inexpensive in terms of cost of capital. As noted, the cash flow projections become positive after year four of operations. At this point, 
Teladoc at home will be generating positive cash flow independently of any invested capital. Thus, no more invested capital will be required after the 75 million projected in year four of operation. The net present value of the revenue streams is also important to take a look at. The revenue streams over the first six years of operation after national rollout with a discount rate of 4%, which is a very generous inflation allowance, that net present value would be approximately $3.2 billion. If one adds a 7% rate of return to the discount rate for net present value, those revenue streams would be worth $2.3 billion. By comparison, the invested capital of $605 million, if using a discount rate of 2%, would be worth currently at $484 million. This shows a very favorable net present value calculation when you look at revenue streams versus invested capital, and is one more sign that this is a very sound investment that is going to generate positive revenue over the long term. As I mentioned earlier, I wouldn't be pitching this if I didn't believe in the projections, if I didn't believe in the high prospects for success that this endeavor has. However, there are key assumptions that have been made that if they turn out to be an error could jeopardize the project. The flat fee to subscribers of third-party payers and benefit plans is one obvious weakness. Of course, a flat fee for unlimited use immediately evokes thoughts of MoviePass and its failed bid to revolutionize the movie industry. However, this is not the same thing. People do not get health care the way they go to the movies. The reliance on a breakage rate that the MoviePass entrepreneurs had was clearly foolish. However, Teladoc's utilization, despite its similar model, has never gone above 15%, even during the pandemic. Because of the additional burdens on both providers and patients of initiating at-home care and being ready to receive that care, uh, and also the general pathway towards that care, which is going to require elevation from virtual visit for many uh, of the patients who utilize the service. It's felt that the utilization rate when calculated as visits per paid subscribers is unlikely to exceed six to 7% for Teladoc at home. Obviously though, since additional visits from these paid subscribers do not generate additional revenue, higher utilization rates will require the Rapid Action Committee to reassess fee and pricing schedules and come up with a different structure or higher fees overall. Additionally, per visit subscriber fees could be raised slightly to counterbalance this. However, one would have to be careful not to raise the fees to the point where the out-of-pocket costs for care at an office or urgent care would no longer uh, be substantially higher. Other assumptions that have been made that are key to the financial success of Teladoc at Home and to the accuracy of these projections would be the cost per visit assumption. This is one of the key metrics that will have to be controlled and monitored very, very closely, especially in the test market phase. If visits last longer than are predicted, providers may require additional compensation for their time. If distances are longer, mileage compensation may go up. And if supply consumption is higher or cost of supplies are higher than projected, that could affect that metric as well. Obviously, again, with flat fee rates coming from third-party payer members, those increased costs cannot be recouped by increasing their fees, at least not initially. Uh, when new contracts come around and annual fees are changed, it can be accounted for then. But accuracy here prior to national rollout is key, and that's one of the key functions of the test market phase. Uh, obviously, the the per visit fees can be increased more quickly in response to the problems with cost per visit estimates. But if these are way off, then again, the entire pricing model of the Teladoc at home system will have to be changed and addressed through the Rapid Action Committee. 
A final key assumption that could significantly alter the structure and success of Teladoc at home would be sluggish demand. Because Teladoc Health should be able to funnel a decent amount of volume directly into Teladoc at home, it's felt that TAH will reach its demand projections fairly quickly. There will be an initial ramp up. It's not felt that we'll start in the test market phase at 2,000 visits per month, but projections assume that that will be reached at roughly 9 to 10 months of operation. Similarly, the 1.25 million visits in the first year of national rollout will not occur in the first month, but it's felt to occur within the first year. If these projections are met more slowly and if they are exceedingly sluggish, it will be very hard for Teladoc at Home to meet these projections. The Rapid Action Committee will have to assess and reforecast and determine additional pricing and marketing schedules and at that point also begin to determine whether or not there would be a go no go for continuation. However, given the growth and support of Teladoc in the past, also given its ability to help launch Teladoc at home in a very seamless and effective manner, it is not felt that these issues will be critical to the future of Teladoc at home or to its ultimate success. A brief discussion of the regulatory environment, compliance, and ethics before we conclude. Obviously, healthcare regulations are myriad and many. Compliance is of utmost importance. The lack of regulatory compliance can jeopardize the quality of care. It can jeopardize the ability to deliver care. It can jeopardize reputation. And so having a robust compliance team and also making sure that human resources is recruiting and credentialing only the most ethical as well as the most talented providers is going to be paramount to the continued function of Teladoc at home. Fortunately, as with many things, Teladoc Health has a robust compliance and ethics program in place. Teladoc at home will be able to benefit from this greatly. However, you cannot separate ethical care from quality care and making sure that a culture of this is continued from its parent and deepened through its own operations is going to be very important to Teladoc at Home's ability to create trust and deep bonds that are necessary to go into communities and create improved health and wellness throughout them. It will also be important for corporate social responsibility platforms to be in place so that we can take the intent to do these things into action and so that we can give back to the communities that Teladoc at Home will serve. In the end, I think it is clear that Teladoc at Home has excellent potential for success. There is an unexplored market that's available. It has tremendous competitive advantages and the financial projections presented here show that if executed properly with correct planning, this should be a very profitable endeavor worth the investment of the company to get it going. And also ultimately, there has to be trust in the leadership of the people guiding this endeavor. We want to know when giving out money for such an initiative, are the people involved ethical are they organized? Are they planning things properly? Are they putting in the effort and willing to have the sweat equity necessary to be successful? I propose to you that I am that person. As one venture capitalist said to me, I look at somebody and I ask myself, am I willing to get in trouble with that person? Because ultimately all of these projects run into trouble. And I am definitely somebody you can get in trouble with because I will plan, I will work, and I will find a way through. Thank you for your time and attention. Have a great day.
us.